Uh, so my challenge is to present a portrayal that I think will be perhaps contrary to what you might have imagined, and that's the job of the academic. Uh, how many people have texts? Raise your hand. Okay, we cannot actually begin until everyone has a text. So I have to wait. Okay. Fine. So I'll dance and sing for you for the minute before I have to I tried to do a very long introduction, but it was not long enough. I wrote about 25 years ago, a, I wrote a book called Jihad, The Origin of Holy War in Islam. I was interested in looking at the Quranic view of war and violence, uh, which is very much in the Quran. Uh, some people may say differently, but it's not true. There's a lot of violence in the Quran. But I would argue probably less violence than in the Bible. And uh, I was interested in trying to understand if there was a, an intertextual historical relationship between the ideas of war in the earliest layers of Islam and the ideas of war in the biblical world or among Jews or perhaps the influence was from pre-Islamic Arabian, Arabian paganism. There are lots of ways to understand where people get their ideas. And so I wrote this book. And in the course of writing this book, I, am a, I tried to be an honest, objective researcher. And so as I wrote this book about a religious other, something that was not my religion, and I could be very critical, I also, uh, at the same time, began doing the identical research on my own tradition in order to keep me honest. You can't approach one religion with one methodology and your own religion with another methodology if you want to be a, a real scholar. And so the net result of that eventually was, after many papers, was a book called Holy War in Judaism, The Fall and Rise of a Controversial Idea. And in that book, I take the reader all the way through from the early biblical period up to the present day and follow the course of Jewish teaching and ideology associated with violence in war. And that's basically what I'm going to be doing today. So you can save the 35 euro it would cost to buy the book and the hours it might take to read it, and you'll get the short answer right here. Everybody has the text now? We're, we're close. All right, one, one more thing I often say before I begin um, my teaching with my students is never believe anyone who stands in front of you and tells you what the truth is, including me. Do not believe anything I say. I have the responsibility to back it up with evidence to you. I can't just say, trust me. So don't trust me. So I have these texts because I don't want you to trust me. I want to demonstrate to you. I'm not proving anything. I don't think anyone can prove anything on this topic. But I want to demonstrate to you that my perspective is accurate, even if it's not the whole story. And the way to do that is to look through Jewish tradition and literature and to see what the Jews wrote and thought about the issues that we're discussing. Don't trust me, look at the text. That's why you need to have the text. But then I also tell my students, okay, so someone stands in front of you and is thumping, we say in English, in American English, you thump the Bible. You say the Bible says this and therefore it's true. You have to ask them first of all to give you that text because who knows whether that person is even telling you what the text says. So you have the text in front of you and then you can look at it. You still have to be careful and not necessarily trust the person in front of you, me included. Because there are two ways I can manipulate you by giving you the text. One is I make the translations myself or I can rely on a translation that conforms to my ideas. So that's a distortion. I may be doing it on purpose, or I may not be doing it on purpose, but it might be my intuitive inclination. The other thing you need to be careful about when someone gives you a text is, that's not the whole story. I'm choosing what texts to give you. 
I could give you a different set of texts, and I could probably create a different story. This happens all the time in interreligious argument. We say, you see in the news, and you see uh, in blogs, constantly, uh, all the descriptions of violence in Islam, and usually they are based on true texts and true material. But you don't get from these blogs the descriptions of the nonviolent vectors of thinking or trajectories of thought in the Muslim world, and they exist as well. I could, I could prove to you that, prove to you, so to speak, that Islam is a, well, let's not even talk about Islam. I could prove to you that Judaism is a horrible, violent uh, religion. And plenty of people have said this in the past. And I could point out texts that I choose from the Bible and the rabbinic literature in the modern day, and I could make the argument and it would look foolproof. But then I could take a different set of texts and I could argue a very different position. So you have to be careful about how people are making their arguments. With that said, and now I think everyone has texts, with that said, I'm going to take you on a journey of about 3,000 years, and I'm going to point to authentic texts that demonstrate a position that I observe in the long durée of history in Jewish life regarding war and violence. And uh, I think that these texts are demonstrating a historical trend and development, and we'll see if you agree with me or not. Okay? So I'm gonna, here's my story. My story is that in the earliest period, Judaism, which nobody knew anything called Judaism at the time, but the religion and the worldview of ancient Israel in the biblical period, before even the Second Temple period, and including into the Second Temple period, the Jews were, or the Israelites were, like every other community of people, engaged in a lot of violence, uh, and that was just the way of life. Um, and this is a general understanding of how religion works. I am now going to kind of shift for a moment. I, can, I give this lecture also about Christianity with a very different story. And I haven't yet, but I could give the same lecture about Islam. The story basically is this. Here's my, the theory that's backgrounding the material. A religion, a monotheistic scriptural tradition, that means Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, these all three traditions have very many variations within them. But the general trend within the scriptural monotheisms is that when violence, bloody violence, is beneficial for the community of believers, a religion will not hesitate to engage in it. I'll say that again. When bloody violence is understood by the religion, it's a big question, how does a religion make these decisions, right? Are these people, institutions, right? But when a religion, which I kind of personify, feels or understands that violence is good for it, for its benefit, for the community of believers within that religious tradition, it will not hesitate to engage in it. It will kill people who threaten it from the outside or from the inside. Sectarian movements, heresies, inquisitions. There's no problem. All religions will do that. But when violence is understood to be detrimental or dangerous for the survival or the well-being of a religious community, a religious community will find a way to stop the violence. Exhibit A. Christianity emerged in history under the yoke of the Roman Empire. Empires require a monopoly on violence, just like governments today. You as an individual, wherever you live, are forbidden to engage in carrying out of justice yourself. If someone steals your car, you can't find that person and grab the car back and beat him up. You can't punish them. That's for the government to do. The government in Western societies is supposed to have a monopoly on violence. We have a problem in the US, 
The government is not very successful with having a monopoly on violence. But that's the theory. When you don't have government, then tribes, families, and communities must engage in their own acts to get their own justice. When you have no functional government, then tribes and families do the same thing. In the ancient Israelite world, there was no functional universal government, no European Union, no United Nations, no systems of a, a relationship between powers. It was all a, a question of who is more powerful. You can take what you want. So all the, all the communities, religious communities, ethnic communities, racial communities, linguistic communities, all had to engage in violence in order to protect themselves. This happened at the large level and also even within the family or clan level. But when you have an empire, that's impossible. It's forbidden. So the Israelites grew up in a world in which there was no universal system. There were no empires when Israel grew up. The Assyrians and the Babylonians would come later. The Egyptians, who were in control of the land prior to the emergence of Israel, contracted, as did the other Mesopotamian empires. So there was no system. All the various tribal communities in the ancient world engaged in violence in order to survive. And there was a lot of killing. Christianity emerged into history under the rule of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire controlled all violence. The Christians hated the Romans as much as the Jews hated the Romans, because the Romans persecuted Christians and Jews for not worshiping the emperor and engaging in this kind of uh, Acknowledgement, which is a, a challenge to their own religious traditions. But the tradition, but, it, but Christianity did not rebel against the Roman Empire because it would have been suicidal to do so. So Christianity began as a quietist, almost pacifist movement, although in the New Testament there's a lot of rage and violence, but it's not directed outward in a sense of war. But the moment that Christianity became Roman, the moment the Roman Empire became Christianized, the Christian institution of Christianity had no qualms in bringing in the legions of the empire in order to, through force of arms and violent war, to further the goals of Christianity. And that was the policy of Christianity from the 4th century until it failed. Once it failed in the 16th century, 15th, 16th, 17th century in Europe, with the bloody wars of the Thirty Years' War, which was the culmination of Christian violence against Christians, it was so self-destructive to the church that the church pulled back and then said, no, we shouldn't be involved in politics and in bloody wars. That's for governments to do, for kings and nobles and people like that. We can't do it because it was completely destroying the community. Uh, upwards of 11 million people were killed in the Thirty Years' War, mostly in Northern Europe. So, you understand? That's the theory behind this. Okay. So, in the ancient world, uh, violence was necessary, I argue, for the ancient Israelite community. And Israel sees God as compassionate and loving, but also violent. I'm only going to give you the violent side today, so be careful. This is not the whole story of ancient Judaism, but this is a big piece of it. Are we all together? Get it? We're all okay? I need you once in a while to like nod your head so I know you're with me. Okay? So I need this or I need this. Okay? Got it. All right. Let's take a look at the first reference. This is every morning in a Jewish service. This is sung every morning. And I want to simply stress this beautiful poem. It's a poem of redemption at the Sea of Reeds. I want to simply stress how militant it is. Here we sing to God, I sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and might, he has become my deliverance. This is my God, and I will enshrine him. The God of my fathers, I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. I could go on, there's a lot more material. God is a powerful God. The God of Israel is stronger than the God of Egypt, destroys the God of Egypt, destroys the gods of the neighboring peoples who are threatening to it. 
whether, you know, God apparently wasn't always successful, but when God was successful, that was remembered. Are we questions, thoughts about this? Okay. Uh, Deuteronomy 3. Um, I, don't, I can't go through all of these texts, so I, my point in this section, and I, I, I'm making sure you have these texts with you so you can take them home and read them more carefully if you're interested. The Deuteronomy 3 text talks about the cherem. What is the cherem? For those of you who study Jewish history, you might have heard of this concept, cherem ha-yishuv, the cherem ha-yishuv. This was a kind of a ban where, where people were banned from the community in Europe, in Ashkenaz. I'm not talking about that cherem. I'm talking about the biblical cherem, which means absolute, total, and complete destruction. It actually means genocide. So when in Deuteronomy 3, I'll talk to you about that in a moment, but if you'll turn the page to the other side, page 2. This is, um, we are supposed to, the commandment of God is to doom the people who live in the towns, in the land of what it will become the land of Israel, to absolute destruction. The English uh, translations are usually doomed. They use the term doom, which doesn't really mean much, but the harem really absolutely means absolute and total destruction. The killing of everything and the destroying of everything. And there's supposed to be no benefit from it. You don't do this in order to get rich. You do this because God told you to do it. Let's look at the next text, Deuteronomy 7. And here I'm going to read this to you. When the Lord your God, this is Deuteronomy 7, this is before the conquest of the land of Canaan by the Israelites, just before the conquest, this last sermon of Moses to give Moses instructions to the Israelites. When the Lord your God brings you to the land that you are about to enter and possess, and he dislodges many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, etc., seven nations much larger than you, and the Lord your God delivers them to you, and you defeat them. You must doom them to destruction, grant them no terms, and give them no quarter. That means that you kill everyone. That's, that was the commandment. Now, was it ever carried out or not? There's some theories about this. I'd be happy to talk to you about it, but not at this moment. So if you don't, you're not sure, I, I didn't tell you one more thing about the way I give texts. I try to give the Hebrew text as well. So if you doubt the translation, go to the Hebrew text. I've underlined it oftentimes, the important words, and show it to someone who knows something about Hebrew, or Biblical Hebrew, or Rabbinic Hebrew, and double check it to make sure it's okay. So here's my argument. My argument is that at least in theory, the Israelites are so violent that they are not uh, afraid to engage in absolute destruction of communities. Uh, and in the Joshua texts, you'll see that they did this in theory. So the Deuteronomy text is before the conquest. The Joshua text is at least construed by the Bible as something that actually occurred. I, I do have what we call a nechemta. Do you know, anybody know what that term means, nechemta? A nechemta means a kind of consolation. This probably never happened, but it could have happened. And since it's in biblical text, I mean, historically, we don't think there was a conquest of the land of Israel. And we don't know if there were cases where entire communities were destroyed. But at least that was the command that was in the text of the Bible, in the Torah even, the five books of Moses, the most sacred kernel of Jewish tradition. Questions, thoughts? Are we okay with this? Should we move on? Okay. Now on page three, this is a really wonderful story about being tempted to worship the religions of neighboring peoples and the temptation of worshiping worshiping the religions of neighboring peoples is couched or is articulated in this text in a, a form of kind of sexual attraction. The religion of the Ammonites and the Moabites 
not only they were, it was interesting for the Israelites, partly because it was, involved, it was involved with sex. How so exactly? We're not sure. There's some ideas about how that works. But at least the Bible does show, or, or at least portray it that way. And so here's a case of a man who is becoming attached, they call it attached to Baal Peor, which was the name of the god of the, uh, of the Moabites. And he was having sex with a woman who was attracting him. And uh, out of his, so let me just, um, um, and, and he was doing it basically in public. So I'm gonna go down to the bottom of the page where it says the Lord spoke to Moses. No, no, actually, let's say, let's go up one paragraph. Just then, do you see that? Just then, just as this was happening, just then one of the Israelites came and brought a Midianite woman over to his companions in the sight of Moses and of all the Israelite community who were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting. They were weeping because people were suddenly leaving to go to uh, worship these gods. When Pinchas, the son of Elazar, Eliezer, son of Aaron, the priest, saw this, he left the assembly and taking a spear in his hand, he followed the Israelite into the chamber and stabbed both of them, the Israelite and the woman, through the belly. They were in the middle of having sex. And he simply stabbed them both through in the middle of the act. And then the plague against the Israelites was checked. Those who died of the plague number 24,000. That is, God was so angry with the Israelites for being tempted to worship another god that God brought this plague on Israel. When Pinchas it took the initiative to murder, I guess we wouldn't say murder, but would be to carry out the punishment of killing these two people, the plague immediately ceased and the Israelites were saved. It's not over, the story's not over. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Pinchas, son of Eliezer, son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the Israelites by displaying among them his zealotry for me is kina'ah, so that I did not wipe out the Israelite people in my zealousness. Say therefore, I grant him my pact of friendship. It shall be for him and his descendants after him a pact of priesthood for all time, because he took zealous action for his God, thus making expiation for the Israelites. That means you have to be, I mean, that, that's a lesson, right? You have to break out of the norm and engage in your own vigilante violence in order to solve the problem, according to how we might read this text. And the word here is kina'ah. It becomes important because some Jewish movements, not only, well, in later times under the Romans and also under the modern state of Israel, were called kana'im, zealots, and they were extreme. So we have this kind of, I could say, ISIS uh, sort of perspective within the Jewish tradition. Remember, we have an ISIS perspective within all religious traditions. I'm gonna take a moment to make a slight tangent and then we're gonna move on. Here's the tangent, another theoretical tangent. Religions, as I mentioned earlier, are big things. We don't even, in the modern study of religion, oftentimes we don't even say Christianity anymore. We use a different term. We say Christianities, Islams, Judaisms, because as you know, for whatever religious tradition you may have grown up in, you know that they're very complicated and they have different movements and counter movements and different positions on not only theology, but on practice. And so some Christian communities don't even call other Christian communities Christian in the United States. There are, the majority of active Christians in the United States do not call Catholics Christian. They say, we are Christian. I'm talking about the evangelical community. We say, we are Christians, they are Catholics. Isn't that amazing? But they're all Christians. There are Jews who say, well, Reformed Jews are not Jews. They're not really Jews. But of course they're Jews. They're just so different that they fit outside of the category of what people think is right, that they call them different. So what I'm trying to say is, religion has a wide variety of expression 
on all the important issues of life. One of them, for example, is universal ideas or particularist ideas. When does a religion decide that we need to expend our resources in order to make the world a better place, not just, not just our community? That's a universalist position, a universalist vector of thinking. There is also, in all religions, an extreme particularist vector that says, we can't worry about everybody else in the world. We have to worry about the people in our own community, however you define that. We are going to achieve salvation. We can't help them uh, because we don't have resources or we don't care or they're trying to attack us. So there are particularist vectors or trajectories of thought and there are universalist vectors or, traje or trajectories of thought. And those are in conflict with one another and oftentimes they sort of muddle around in the middle. But when one community or one particular idea becomes dominant within a tradition, then that tradition will move into that direction, will become more universalist in general, but there will always be somebody who are pushing back. Or they will become more particularist in general, although there will always be somebody who pushes back on the other side. Am I making sense? Same thing with violence. In religions, there are vectors of thought that say we need to engage in violence, and if we need to engage in violence, we have no problem with it, in order to achieve the divine requirement that we are obligated to carry out. And there are others that say, no, no, we, we don't engage in violence under any conditions. There are other ways to resolve issues. And so these are always in tension with one another. Good. Okay. So now I argued that in the ancient biblical period, uh, violence was part of the repertoire of ancient Israelite life. Everybody knew about it, people were involved in it, there was no pushback against it, it was normal. If you didn't engage in violence, you would have been destroyed by your neighbors. That begins to change, and it begins to change when violence becomes no longer effective. In the ancient Israelite world, God fight, fought the fights with the Israelites, and they won. They beat the Egyptians. They were able to conquer the land of Israel. But then they lost some battles, some very serious ones. In one, the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. And in the ancient world, if a more powerful uh, community destroyed a less powerful community, it was normal for the less powerful community to abandon its gods and to worship the more powerful god. After all, you get benefits from worshiping God. So why should I worship my God that just got beaten up by the more powerful God? I should abandon my God and worship the God that's going to give me more. That's a normal aspect of, of ancient uh, religious life. And by the way, that's also a normal aspect of modern religious life. People will abandon communities if they don't feel they're getting enough from them and look into new communities to see if they can get more from their engagement. And that actually has an impact on religious affiliation, especially in the Protestant world, in America, for example, but also even across big boundaries like Jews and Christians, Christians, Jews, and Muslims. That's a different topic. So um, that was a fiasco for the Israelites. But 70 years later, God, or at least it was understood by the Israelites, God brought them back to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So the destruction of the temple was seen as a punishment by God through the tool of the Babylonian Empire in order to get the Israelites straight, to get them to wake up and be good. But once they did that, the temple was rebuilt. That was a, an ideology that worked. But the second time the temple was destroyed, it didn't work anymore. It never was rebuilt. And the issue of punishment wasn't simply enough. Right? That is, a new way of doing business had to be developed. So I'm going to kind of skip over the Second Temple references on page four. I'm simply trying to show here from references from the Second Temple period that there were plenty of Jews, and now they were calling themselves Judeans, Jews who continued the assumption 
that God would fight the battles for, of Israel to destroy the enemies, and some of them were extremely violent, and there were cases where they massacred Romans, tricked them, killed them, uh, did all kinds of things that we would consider not fair game in war, but that was part of the way of doing business in the ancient world. Right. I'm going to now move you up to the destruction of the temple the second time. When did the temple in Jerusalem, when was it destroyed by the Romans? Does anybody know that? It's a big, a big, big moment in history for Jews. Everybody remembers that in theory. 70, the year 70, the Common Era, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Uh, there was Jewish zealots and fighters who were fighting the Romans. Uh, Christians did not fight the Romans. Jews did because God won the battles for the Jews when they were pious and doing the right thing. That's the equation. If you are a, if you're good as a community, God will fight the battles for you and you will win. If you don't win the battles that you are fighting, then you are, you're doing something wrong and God is punishing you through the destruction that results. So militancy and was normal in ancient Israelite world in the pre, in the biblical period and in the second, all the way up until the second temple. And then even, even when the Israelites lost some wars, they won important wars. For example, the wars against the Greeks. The, the Judeans won, beat the Greeks. And we have a victory celebration in Jewish tradition that we celebrate every year, which is a victory of the, of, of the uh, celebration of the victory of destruction of the Greeks in the, um, in, the, in the Hellenistic world of ancient Israel. What's that celebration called? Called Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Okay, that's it. It's a victory celebration. All right. But then it stopped working. When it stopped working, it was really destructive. When the, when the Romans destroyed the temple in the year 70, Jerusalem was knocked down. The thousands and thousands of people were killed and made homeless. There was starvation and communities, probably more people died from the uh, connected problems with, of war than from the actual violence of the war itself. It was terrible. Remember when I said that the first temple was destroyed and then 70 years later, God brought the Israelites back to the land of Israel and they rebuilt their temple after the Babylonians destroyed the first time? That, that's a trope, that's a, that's a theme. The first temple was destroyed, the Israelites were brought to ba Babylon in exile. 70 years later, a new king arose, destroyed the Babylonian Empire, and allowed the Jews to go back to the land of Israel. That was understood in Jewish tradition as a divine act. The king who helped the Israelites was named Koresh, he was a Persian king. And you know what he's called in the biblical text? Messiah. He's called Mashiach because he had a messianic role in bringing the Israelites back to Judah, Judea. Seventy years after the destruction, they came back. Okay, now move up uh, 500 years. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed a second time by the Romans, not by the Babylonians. Terrible destruction, horrible, it was horrible. Seventy years later, there was a big movement a messianic movement that believed that it could retake the temple, destroy the Roman Empire with the help of God if everyone would be good enough, pious Jews, and then reestablish Jewish sovereignty in the land again. That was called the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. Have anybody heard about that? The Bar Kokhba Revolt? It happened 70 years after the destruction of the temple. That's not coincidence. I mean, 64, 63 years, 64 years, but it was in that was to move up so that the 70th year would be the, the year of, of victory. And it failed even worse than the first destruction of the temple in 70 by the Romans. The second time, the Romans wanted to teach the Jews a lesson. 
and they completely made the southern part of Judea Yudenrein. Jews could not be within eyeshot of, the, of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, or they could be killed on the spot by a Roman warrior. Jews were, there was so much destruction and so much killing that it was almost, it was, it, the, the Jewish people was in danger of being completely destroyed. There were all the, 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 the leadership was wiped out. The priests were wiped out. The rabbis that were starting this kind of reinvigorate Judaism were wiped out. There are all kinds of stories about how horrific it was for the people. Now, I'm arguing that as a result of that, that absolute and total failure, the remnants of the Jewish people in the land of Israel did everything they could to prevent any Jews from becoming militant again. And they created what I call safeguards to prevent militancy. And here we see a major shift in Jewish policy on war. It shifts from militancy, that's fine, it was working, sometimes they didn't work, but mostly it did, so it was fine. And it was so destructive and overwhelming that it had to stop. Any questions about that or thoughts? Now I'm going to give you some texts to, to uh, take a look at it. Let's take a look on the bottom of page four. We have to back up a moment. The bottom of page four is a relatively late biblical text that discusses rules of engagement in fighting in war. This is biblical, militant, and basically there are three parts to this text. I'm going to just read to you the last couple. You can read at home your own, on your own if you're interested. When, a, when you're about to go out to battle, here it says, God is speaking. When you take the field against your enemies and you see horses and chariots, forces larger than yours, have no fear of them, for the Lord your God who brought you forth from the land of Egypt is with you. And then there's a kind of ceremony in which uh, the priests address the people and then administrators address the people and don't worry because God will fight your battles for you. Now turn the page. All right, actually I made a mistake. We have to go back again. Let's read on from verse five. Then the officials shall address the troops and they say, is there anyone who has built a house, a new house, but hasn't dedicated it? Well, if so, then that person should go home because he might die in battle and another would dedicate his house. All that work that he did to create a house and he goes out to battle, somebody else is gonna get the house, that's not fair. Then he says, is there anyone who has planted a vineyard but has not yet harvested it? Let him go back to his home, lest he die in battle and another harvest it. Are you with me? Now we're turning the page and we're on verse seven. Is there any man who has paid the bride price for a wife, but who has not yet married her? In the ancient world, there were two wedding ceremonies. The first wedding ceremony was a, uh, a nisuin. It was a, like a, you, you basically made a public statement. This boy and this girl are for one another. Don't think about it. Okay? And that, that's a pledge, family to family. And then the, the, those people might be 11 years old, 9 years old, and then later there will actually be the Kiddushin, which will actually sanctify the wedding. That could be years later. So you may pay the bride price, you may actually make a transaction where you are supposed to be married to one another, but you haven't actually married each other and consummated the marriage. So if that's the case, then the administrator says, let him go back to his home lest he die in battle and somebody else marry his wife. And then the officials go on and they address the troops and they say, is there anyone who is really afraid or disheartened? Let him go back to his home lest the courage of his comrades flag or become weak like his. So these are four deferments, we would say, in the military. 
four reasons where young men don't have to actually serve. One is if they built a house and they haven't dedicated it. One is if they planted a vineyard and they haven't harvested it. A third is if they haven't, if they've paid the bride price, they've had an uh, engagement but they haven't gotten married. And the fourth is if they're just too damn scared, they should go home. Now, in fact, all of them, all of those deferments are to prevent people from becoming good fighters. Because if you have some questions, like, I really wish I were home, I I'm worried about my, my vineyard coming in, they're not going to be as good a fighter as if they're really out there. So that's the deferments. And then the rest of this is about what you're, able, what you're allowed to do when you attack a town. How many people you can kill, what kind of people you can kill, what kind of people you can't kill or shouldn't kill, and it's very interesting. But that's, that's we're not going to deal with, because now we're finished with the biblical period. I'm just giving you this information, because now we're going to read the Mishnah. What is the Mishnah? Anybody, whoever's heard of the Mishnah, raise your hand. Okay. The Mishnah is a collection of tradition of the rabbis, where rabbis discussed issues of importance. Who are the rabbis? They're interesting. There are no rabbis in the Bible. In the Bible there are kings, there are priests, there are prophets, there are no rabbis. Rabbis begin to emerge after the biblical period. And Rav simply means great, sort of like saying, your highness. And a Rav is a person who is learned in the tradition, and therefore he has a title of being Rav. Learned in the tradition means that not only do they know the Bible, but they also know traditions of the ancients that have been passed down from generation to generation. In rabbinic worldview, these traditions originated at Mount Sinai. What happened? What do you mean they originated at Mount Sinai? I thought the Ten Commandments were given at Mount Sinai. Well, there was more than the Ten Commandments given at Mount Sinai. According to Christian tradition, the Ten Commandments were given at Mount Sinai. According to Jewish tradition, 613 commandments were given at Mount Sinai. And they were all written down and included in the text of the Bible. And we can count them in the text of the Torah, the first five books. According to rabbinic tradition, there was more, even more than that. According to, now I'm going back to the Bible, according to the Bible story, Moses went up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, and he stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights. You might think, what was he doing there for 40 days and 40 nights? He probably was not playing chess with God. <laughs> he probably was not like, you know, relaxing in a sauna or a spa. So what was he doing? So it de there developed a tradition in Judaism that during the 40 days and 40 nights that Moses was at Mount Sinai, he was learning from God. Learning, like what you do in a yeshiva. You learn from your rav. You learn from your master. So Moses was learning the depth of ideas and traditions and laws and perspectives and methodologies that would later be written down in the Mishnah. How do we know that? Because there is a part of the Mishnah itself that says that when Moses came down from Sinai, when he was about to die, he gave that tradition to the person who followed him. Who was that? Who followed Moses as a leader of the, of the Israelite people? Joshua. And then Joshua passed down all that lore that he learned from Moses to the elders of the community. Then the elders of the community passed down all that lore to the judges, the shoftim, the, the tribal chiefs. And they passed down that tradition eventually to the rabbis. So the rabbis were the purveyors of the tradition that came from Mount Sinai, and they wrote it down in the Mishnah. The Mishnah is a post-biblical sacred text for rabbinic Jews. Right. Now the Mishnah becomes very important for our story because the Mishnah looks like it's going against 
all of the ideas of the Hebrew Bible about war and violence. The Mishnah and then the, and the Gemara, that's the Talmud, is eventually going to overturn the militancy of the Hebrew Bible. It was tasked with overturning it. Why? Well, there's no certain answer to this question, but I would, I would say the answer is because it was too dangerous. The Jews had, won, had lost too many battles. They didn't want hot-headed young Jews to go out like Bar Kokhba did and try to start a war against the Romans and be even more destroyed. Because maybe, maybe one of these powers is really going to commit a full genocide against the Jewish people. So the rabbis of the Mishnah began that process of overturning the militancy of the Hebrew Bible. Am I making sense, at least in theory? Now let's see how it happened. They did it in three different ways. There are three safeguards. One is they defined what it meant to go to a battle. Or what they defined what it meant, let me put it this way, they defined a war that was so sacred and important that everyone had to drop everything they do to go and fight it. And then what wars were not so important. This was the first task, I would say. And we see that on the the middle of page five in the Mishnah. Remember that we just read above that there are four deferments from fighting in the army. There are four deferments. You don't have to fight if you've planted a vineyard, if you built a house, if you didn't get married completely yet, or if you're just too scared. You remember that? Shake your head, wave your head. Okay. Now, the Mishnah is dealing with these deferments it can't just be one who built a house. What if somebody built a horse barn? What if somebody planted not a vineyard, but a wheat field? Does that not count too? So for the first six chapters of the Mishnah, they're discussing all the possibilities of what would be included within the deferments. And then at the end, they ask the question. And here are, we're in the middle where it says Mishnah Sota. Do you see us there? We all there? Yeah, I need you to nod your head. Then the question is asked, to what does all the above refer? All of these issues of deferments. It refers to a discretionary war, milchemet reshut. But everyone must go out to fight in a commanded war, milchemet mitzvah. Even a bridegroom from his chamber and a bride from her wedding canopy. That's all we need to know. We don't have to read the second part. That's just a variation on what we just read. That's really interesting. If you look in the entire Bible, will you never, ever, ever, one time, see the term discretionary war? And you'll never see the term commanded war. They don't exist there. These are constructs that the rabbis have created in order to understand how the Bible works. Commanded war becomes understood in rabbinic literature to mean a war that's commanded by God. If you are commanded, you are obligated to engage in it. If it's discretionary, it means it's up to you to engage in it. Okay. So all the deferments in the Bible, according to the rabbis in the Mishnah, apply only to discretionary wars, but not commanded wars. Oh, great. Fantastic. That's the end of the discussion. So what's a discretionary war? They don't say. What's a commanded war? They don't say that either. That's up to people who come later to try to figure out. That's interesting. All right. Now, there's a long discussion in the Gemara, which is a, an extension of the Mishnah, that deals with this in more detail. And I'm going to give you just a synopsis in this chart, because otherwise it would take us probably three days instead of an hour and a half. You see on the bottom of the page, it says categories of war. These are rabbinic, we're on page five, bottom of the page, rabbinic categories of war. Now, all we're really concerned with is discretionary and commanded. You see the third category to the right, on the top, it says obligatory, chova. That is eventually going to drop out of rabbinic thought and eventually in medieval Jewish thought. So we don't have to worry about that. 
well, let's worry about trying to understand the difference between this discretionary war and a commanded war. Remember, a discretionary war means a war that is not commanded by God. It might be an obligatory war. It might be you, the king might go and say you need to engage in this war, but the deferments apply to those wars. More important is to understand what is a commanded war. What is a war that you have to go and fight even if, in theory, you have no armies. If God says you have to do it, then you have to do it. So we have to figure that out. Okay, the Mishnah, there are two different positions. Doesn't really matter. Let's go to the Talmud. In the Talmud, they finally decide to think about what might be examples of a war that's a discretionary war or a commanded war. Are you with me? Okay, according to the Jerusalem Talmud, a discretionary war that is a war for which the deferments apply, is a war that is initiated by Israel, that is the Israelites. If, they, if they're attacking somebody from the outside, that's not commanded. I mean, you're not being attacked or anything, so, so you don't necessarily have to go. That's like you want to win more territory, you want to get rich, you want more land. That is not commanded, that's discretionary because you're living in the land of Israel already in theory. But, oh, okay, actually, right. So, but commanded wars are, not David's wars here, it's, it's this complicated, so I'm so sorry to do this because now I'm trying to simplify it and I'm even making it more complicated. The most important issue is that the rabbis um, say, that is, the majority says, that, that the obligatory wars, they call it obligatory, but it later is called commanded, the obligatory wars for which the deferments do not apply are Joshua's wars and defensive wars. Defensive wars make sense, right? You're being overrun by people from outside and you need to defend your homes. That's a war in which everyone needs to engage in fighting. No deferments. But what's Joshua's wars? What's that? Anybody have an idea? The wars of conquest. Joshua was the, was the leader of the Israelites who conquered the land of Israel. So Joshua's wars was wars of conquest. So here's how I'm going to tell you how I think, I think they understood this. There are deferments for wars that are initiated in order to gain more territory. You don't have to go. But if you're defending your homes, everyone must fight. That's a commanded war. It's a holy war, basically. And the wars of conquest of the land of Israel, that was commanded by God, because God said to, to, to the people, go out and conquer Israel. We read some of those texts earlier. Are we all together? We, yeah? Okay. So Joshua's wars, when were they? For the rabbis. For the rabbis, Joshua's wars were a thousand years earlier or more. So they weren't really a possibility. So for the rabbis, the only possibility for a commanded war was one of defense. You couldn't go out and conquer anything else. The Babylonian Talmud, you didn't know there were two Talmuds, did you? That makes it even more complicated. The Babylonian Talmud, which is more extensive than the, than the Palestinian Talmud, or the Jerusalem Talmud, has a slightly different perspective. And this is the one that becomes dominant. Babylonian Talmud becomes dominant in Jewish life. So a discretionary war, according to the Babylonian Talmud, is David's wars of expansion, because he actually expanded the borders of the land of Israel, according to the Bible, and, and created an empire, conquered other lands outside the borders of the land of Israel. Or a preemptive strike. That also is a uh, discretionary war for which there are deferments. But an obligatory war, or a commanded war, is Joshua's wars of conquest. Right? That becomes the important issue. All right, uh, we can go back to this in a little while, but first I want to read you a story. The rabbis divided all the possibilities of fighting in the Hebrew Bible into two categories discretionary or commanded, and they made it very, very clear that 
when there's a commanded war, everyone needs to fight. That is sacred because it's commanded by God. You could almost call that holy war, although there is no term in Judaism for holy war. That's a Christian term. No term in Judaism for holy war, no term in Islam for holy war. That's a Christian term. One tactic of the rabbis was to divide, to, to divide wars into two categories and try to make it so that it's almost impossible to engage in a sanctified war. Because when was Joshua's wars? It's over. You can't do it anymore. It's over. So the only category of sacred war that everyone really needs to fight is impossible. You can't do it. You only fight when you're being uh, defensive, right? Be trying to um, save yourself. The other safeguard is a question. Who is better for the Jewish people? The great warriors or the great rabbis? Who is more powerful in protecting the Jewish people? The great warrior or the great rabbi? And this story will tell you who was actually more protected. I'm going to read the whole story to you because it's a beautiful story. And you can read along or you can just space out. Rabbi Shimon uh, Bar Yochai taught. This is how it goes. This happens in rabbinic literature. This is from rabbinic literature. This story occurs in the Talmud, and it also occurs in another book that's outside of the Talmud, but is rabbinic literature. It's about the same time. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai taught. Akiva, my teacher, who was one of the most famous of the ancient rabbis, would interpret Numbers 24, 17, a star will step forth from Jacob as follows. Koziba will step forth from Jacob. Okay, this needs a little explanation. There's a statement from the book of Numbers. And the, word, and the, and the, the verse is, it's like, a, it's like a prophecy. A star will step forth out of Jacob. Kochav, a kochav. There was a general, a warrior in Israel that fought against the Romans, whose name was Kospa which sounds a little bit like kochav. In, in Hebrew, it makes more sense than it does in European languages. Kospa. It also sounds a little bit like liar, because kochav is star, kozav or kozev is liar, and his name was kosav or kosev. So somewhere between kochav and kozev, somewhere between a star and a liar. So if a star will step forth from Jacob, Akiva read this, Rabbi Akiva read this first to say, that must be a reference to Bar Kochba, who's going to be the Messiah, who's going to save the Jewish people against the evil Romans. So he put his, his cards on, on this general, and he convinced probably thousands or maybe tens of thousands or more people to follow this general, whose name was Bar Kosba. Okay? And so when he saw Bar Koziba, he would say, this is the King Messiah. But you, you notice how Koziba is spelled here? It's not spelled the way his name really is. His name is actually spelled Kosba, not Koziba. And if you read about him in modern Israeli literature, he's not referred to as Bar Kosba, he's referred to as, anybody know? Bar Kochba. Bar Kochba means son of a star. Like, he is the Messiah. But he's written here as the liar, Koziba. That's because you already know what the intent of this story is going to be. The general is a jerk. But Rabbi Yohanan ben Torta said to him, Akiva, great Rabbi Akiva, weeds will grow out of your cheeks, and the son of David will still not have come. That is, the Messiah will not have come. Don't bet on Koziba. Now here's the story. This is told by a, a gentleman named Rabbi Yohanan, very important rabbi in the uh, early period, the Tana. 80,000 pairs of Roman trumpeters had surrounded Betar. This was the last holdout of the Jews when the Romans were going to destroy everybody. And every single one of them was appointed over a few regiments. That means they had, there was a lot of Romans. Ben Koziba was there and he had 200,000 fighters, each one with a finger cut off. 
The sages sent and they asked him, how long will you make Israelite men unfit? Why did he have their finger cut off? Presumably to see whether they were really tough enough. If they could handle having a finger cut off, you can fight with me. This is a depiction of a general who you don't like already, right? Because <laughs> they, they don't want you to like him. That is, okay? So the rabbis complain, they say, why are you making them unfit? Because they can't be a kohen if you have any kind of mutilation to your body. So he said, how else is it possible to test them? And the sages said, well, anyone who can't ride a horse and uproot a cedar of Lebanon as you, as you ride by will not be enrolled in the army. Right? You know, have you ever seen a cedar of Lebanon? Have you ever tried to uproot a little plant? It's hard to do. Imagine being on a horse and uprooting a cedar of Lebanon as you ride by. So his warriors were very tough. So when he went into battle, he said, God of the universe, this is another, another anti kosva God of the universe, do not help us, do not shame us. In other words, we're not going to count on you, God. We're going to count on our own power to destroy the Romans. That's signing his doom. Okay, so uh, the rest of the Jews of, of the land of Israel has been completely controlled by the Roman enemy. They've controlled everything. They've attacked and destroyed everything. And the last holdout is this big fortress in Betar. Now, for three and a half years, Hadrian, he was the, the general of the Roman legions, and he would later become the emperor of Rome. Hadrian besieged Betar, Betar, this place, while Rabbi Eliezer Hamodai would sit in sackcloth and ashes, praying every day and saying, Master of the universe, do not sit in judgment today. Do not sit in judgment today. Okay, who is Rabbi Eliezer Hamodai? A nobody. We don't know much about him. But he is the rabbi who's inside the city of Betar. He is not a fighter, and he is sitting and he is praying all day and all night in sackcloth and ashes and saying to God, please don't allow the Romans to destroy us. And the great general is saying, don't, don't hurt us and don't help us, God. We can handle it. Right. When Hadrian finally gave up and began to leave off, in other words, Hadrian couldn't conquer Betar. For three years he was besieging this fortress. He couldn't conquer it. And finally, when he was about to leave, a kuti came to him. Who is a kuti? A kutai or a kuti? That is, we're not sure. But the category is a Jew who is not completely in. He could be a Samaritan. He could be a heretic. He's somebody who's not completely loyal to the Jewish people. And so Akuti, who was also there in Betar, he says to Hadrian, how's he going to get a meeting with Hadrian, the, the general of the Roman Legion? I don't know, but okay, he got it. And he said, finally, he said, don't leave because I know what to do in order to force the city to surrender to you. Ah, so he went into the city through a drainage pipe and he found Rabbi Elazar Hamodai. Who is he? He's the one who's praying. He was standing and praying, and this kuti made as if he were whispering in his ear. He just pretended. The rabbi was just praying, davening, 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 and he was sort of pretending he was whispering in his ear, but of course the rabbi wasn't listening to him because he was praying the whole time. So then the inhabitants of the city saw him, and they brought him to Bar Kozba, Koziba. This is, they brought the kuti, the questionable Jew, and they said, we saw this old man chatting with your friend, that means he was chatting with Rabbi Elazar Modai, and they don't trust the Kuti. So therefore, they don't trust Rabbi Elazar Modai, because maybe he is going to side with the enemy. So Koziba says to the Kuti, what did you say to him, and what did he say to you? And the Kuti answered, well, if I tell you, the Roman king will kill me, which means obviously that he is a spy. But if I don't tell you, you will kill me. Better for me that the king kill me and not you. So the Kuti then said to him, in other words, he, he lied. He said, he told me that I should surrender the city. That is, Rabbi Elazar Amodai, who was praying and not even paying attention to this guy. This guy said to the general, he wants to surrender the city. So Rabbi, so uh, Ben Kozba, that is the general, went to Rabbi Elazar and he said to him, what did this Kuti say to you? 
And Elazar, who was davening and didn't even pay attention, said, nothing. And then Bar Kozba, the general, said, what did you tell him? He said, nothing. Then he gave him a kick and he killed it. Immediately, he killed this rabbi. Immediately, a heavenly voice went out and announced the words of Zechariah. Oh, the worthless shepherd who abandons the flock, let a sword fall upon his arm and on his right eye. His arm will certainly shrivel and his right eye go blind. You killed Rabbi Elazar, Hamudai, the arm of all of Israel in the right eye. Therefore, the arm of the man who did that will shrivel and his right eye will be blinded. Immediately, Betar was captured and Ben Kozba was killed. So who was saving the city? Was it Ben Kozma or Rabbi Elazar Modi? According to this story, it was the rabbi. Now here's a, a, a kicker to this. Roman soldiers brought the head of Rabbi Kozma to Hadrian and asked them, who killed, and Adrian, Hadrian then asked the soldiers, who killed this guy? Rabbi, you know, who killed this general Kozma? Akuti said to him, I killed him. Hadrian said, bring me his corpse as proof. So he brought the corpse of the general, around which was curled a big snake. Hadrian said to him, if God did not kill him, who could have killed him? In other words, this is another proof that it was God who destroyed, allowed the Romans to destroy Betar, because militancy is not acceptable anymore. Prayer and devotion and piety is what life is all about. Am I clear about that? That's what the story is teaching. It doesn't occur just once, it occurs twice. The third safeguard, which we'll, we won't take as much time on, is the three vows on page seven. There's a story, there are a lot of stories in the rabbinic tradition, and it's really fun to read these stories. And they're very difficult to understand, that usually have very deep ideas and allusions to lots of things. There's a story about one rabbi who was living in Babylon and wanted to move to the land of Israel. That's what everybody should want to do. And his rabbi didn't want him to go. And so they were arguing with one another. The rabbi was Rabbi Zira, Zira and the rabbi Yehuda. And it doesn't really matter who they are. And they argued according to the way rabbis argue. That is, they fought. Instead of fighting a duel with a sword, Rabbis fight a duel with citations. They cite scripture, they cite arguments, they see who's smarter, and they can kill someone. Not really kill them. But there is a statement in the Talmud that calls rabbinic students shield bearers. They call them shield bearers. Why? Because the rabbinic students who were learning Talmud were like great soldiers. This is an entirely different worldview than the biblical world. Anyway, to make a long story short, the winner of the argument came up with a, an understanding of, a, uh, of a, a verse in the book of the Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon, that um, uh, it says, I make you swear, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the hinds of the field, do not wake or rouse love until it is wished. I'm going to read it to you one more time. It's in, the, it's in like eight lines down from the three vows halfway through. This is God um, kind of speaking, but it's, in fact, it's really a woman speaking in the story. It's, it's a, this is a love poem, the Song of Songs. It's pretty racy. It describes breasts and hips and things like that. It's a very racy poem in the, in the Bible. But the rabbis didn't read it as a racy poem. They read it as a love poem between God and Israel, not between two lovers. I make you swear, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by hinds of the field, do not wake or rouse love until it is wished. Rabbi Zeira teach said, um, they, they go back and forth and back and forth. I'm just going to give you the upshot. From this verse, they derive three vows. Three vows. A vow is a promise, a pledge. One is that Israel, that is the people of Israel, shall not go up to the land of Israel in a wall. What does that mean? First of all, what does that have to do with this verse about not waking or rousing love? Who knows? 
but they figure out a way to make it work. But the upshot is God makes Israel promise to God and to the world that Israel, that is the people, the Jewish people, will not go up to the land of Israel as a wall. That seems to mean, at least that's as it was understood in Jewish tradition, it meant that Jews cannot move en masse to the land of Israel. Does that make sense? So you wonder about Zionism, right? If you made this, if you made this vow, how can there be Zionism? Okay, we'll deal with that later. The second vow that God made the Jews pledge was that they would never rebel or they would not rebel against the nations of the world. Umot HaOlam means Gentiles, non-Jews. So Jews are living in Germany, they're living in France, they're living in Iraq, they're living in Morocco, they're living in Egypt, in Yemen, in Ukraine. They're getting beaten up. They can't fight back. They can't, they can't rebel against the nations in which they're living, among whom they're living. Am I making sense? It's not so good, is it? You can't leave. can't go to the land of Israel anyway. And you can't rebel against the nations. And then the third vow is that the Holy One made the nations of the world swear that they wouldn't subjugate Israel too harshly. A pogrom here and there may be okay, but not too harshly. That's the three vows. Now, this, this thing, which seems obscure and strange, and how did you derive that from the book of Song of Songs, became very, very operative in the Middle Ages. And it kept Jews from rebelling against the Gentiles and getting destroyed by them, and from trying to move the land of Israel and being destroyed on the way. But it always kept Jews in a position of being weak, minorities spread out all around the world, and not in a position to defend themselves. That's the three vows. So now we have three different safeguards that the rabbis put in place in order to try to keep the Israelites from becoming militant again. Question. Yeah, that's a good question. That, that argument would be used by modern, uh, modern rabbinic scholars who are in favor of Zionism, right? Who said, look, these pogroms, the Second World War, that, that invalidates all of the other vows. Now we, we're obligated to go up to the land of Israel. So. But until then, that was su sufficient, it seemed. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now, there's one little piece next. I have until 12.30, right? And we started five minutes late, right? And it's pretty warm in here, isn't it? Okay, so, all right, one last piece. The great Moses Maimonides. The greatest thinker in the Middle Ages wrote a book called Sefer HaMitzvot. And in that book, he chronicled, I remember I told you there are 613 commandments according to Jews. Christians say there are 10 commandments. Jews say there are 613. Jews don't follow the 613, but Christians definitely don't follow all the 10 either. But there are 613 commandments, right? But it never says in the Bible or the Talmud what those commandments are. It says there are 613. It doesn't tell you. What, what are those commandments? So Maimonides, he's so smart, he decided he's going to tell you all of the commandments. So of those 613 commandments, we already know that 365 of them are negative commandments. That means these are things you shall not do. Thou shalt not. Easy to remember, 365. How many days of the year are there? 65. So therefore, there are 248 positive commandments. Commandments that you must do. How do you remember that number? Easy. You know, the 248 bones in the body. Right? Well, wrong, but at least that's what they said. There were 248 bones in the body. So, my, Maimonides decides he's going to find out which are the 365 and which are the 248. So he lists in this very important book, called the Book of the Commandments, Sefer HaMitzvot, in the 12th century, what are the commandments? And he leaves out one commandment. He leaves out probably a bunch of commandments. Anyone who's reading the Torah and who's going through and doing all of this notations 
would come up with a different set. Because how do you determine what's a commandment? Is it within the, the kind of, is it the command form of the verb, or is it the idea, or is it, you know, all these different ways to do it. But one thing he did not do, and it's very interesting, he did not include in his book the commandment to conquer the land of Israel. That's interesting. Because God said to Joshua, command, conquer the land of Israel. God said in the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Numbers, over and over again, conquer the land of Israel. We read some of those commands. They're in the command form. It's pretty obvious. Why did he not include that? And it became a mystery. So he, he included other commandments that were associated with some of the ideas there, but not with commanding the conquest. So, a, probably the second most brilliant man in Jewish history, I mean, that's arguable, but I would say he's up there in the category, is a man named Nachmanides. His name is Moshe ben Nachman, Moses the son of Nachman, Nachmanides. And he lived oh, um, a, a couple of generations after Maimonides. And he wrote a commentary to Maimonides' book of the commandments. And in that commentary, he argued against Maimonides. And what's important is, what's really important for modern Israeli revivication of militancy is the conclusion that he brings. His conclusion is that commanded war, war for conquest, is not related only to the conquest of Joshua, but he understands the conquest of Joshua not as a historical event, but as a type. That is, war for conquest, whether it's the time of Joshua or your own day, is a commanded war. Am I making sense? The rabbis of the Talmud said the war, commanded war, the only commanded war is the war of defense or the war of conquest of Joshua, which happened 2,000 or 1,000 years ago. Nachmanides, who was really smart and very well respected, said, no, that's not exactly what it means. He wouldn't say it exactly like that because you don't just say no to the rabbis, but you say what they really mean is that commanded war is a command for all time in every generation, including this generation. So everyone must be involved in the command. So that, that's going to destroy the Jewish people. Everyone's going to start going up and conquering the land of Israel from Yemen and from, I don't know, from Poland, wherever you are, and they're going to get all wiped out. The other thing he said, though, was, what does it mean, commanded war? It means settling the land, not conquering the land. Kibush Haaretz, conquest of the land, is Yishu Haaretz, settling the land. And he fulfilled his position. Before he died, he went up and moved to the land of Israel and settled there. Maimonides, by the way, who didn't understand commandment as being engaged in any time after the time of Joshua, and moved to the land of Israel and then left and went to Cairo because it was a much more interesting place to live for him, intellectual center. But Nachmanides really lived it out. And he said that uh, settling in the land. But he also said that if you cannot do it, you can't observe all of the commandments all of the time. You try. It's impossible. There's no Jew, ultra-Orthodox, Orthodox, super-duper from Jew, who will say to you that we can observe all of those 613 commandments. It's impossible. So therefore you try to observe as many commandments as possible, but you, uh, you know that you, you're limited. All right. So I've just shown you that Jewish life or pre-Jewish life, biblical religion was pretty militant. And it was effective, and they survived and lived for a thousand years with this position. When it stopped working, it had to change because it was in danger of destroying the, the Jewish people. So the rabbis of the Talmud re-envisioned the meaning of texts in the Hebrew 
Bible in order to get rid of the notion of Jewish militancy and to make it into quietism. You suffer like Rabbi Elazar Modahi, you sackcloth and ashes, and you will survive, and you can also enjoy life too, but you're certainly not going to need to be in control of uh, your own political destiny. You have to live until the Messiah will come. When will the Messiah come? That's then the big question. Will the Messiah come today? Maybe. In rabbinic tradition, the Messiah can come any day, including today. Or the Messiah might come next week, or next decade, or next century. But the Messiah will eventually come. It's a sign of hope for the Jewish people. We're living in exile. The Messiah will come. The understanding of the three vows was, why did God make this, these three vows? Because it's not the Jews' decision to decide when to redeem itself. That's right. The Jewish people cannot redeem itself. It's God who redeems the Jewish people. And if you try to redeem the Jewish people yourself, you are destined to fail. This is a rabbinic position. You have to wait until God makes the decision. Now, there have been messianic movements in Jewish history. They all failed, and many of them failed with terrible destruction. I don't know if you are aware of this, but um, Shabtai Tzvi movement, for example, which was a 17th, 17th century Jewish messianic movement, resulted in the deaths of thousands and thousands of Jews. So Jewish, Jewish, Jewish tradition and Jewish leadership has always tried to suppress messianic movements. They're too dangerous. But a Messiah will come. And when the Messiah comes, we need to be ready. Here's the tension. You need to be ready. You need to drop everything when the Messiah comes because it will be redemption time. But you can't not just trust anybody to be the Messiah. So how do you know the Messiah has come or not? Well, there's been all kinds of speculation. What are the signs of the Messianic coming? What are the ikvata de Meshicha, the footsteps of the Messiah that might be coming at any time? because we don't know. Well, in the wake of the horrible pogroms of Jews in Eastern Europe, in the wake of the Holocaust, the, the general movement, or shit, there was a shift in Judaism to begin that process of moving away from quietism and into more militarism. Why? Because quietism wasn't working anymore. That's the bottom line. When your position is no longer effective for the benefit of the people, then it has to change, and religions will do that. Remember, you, we won a lot of wars in the ancient biblical period. When it stopped working, the rabbis had to find a way to fix it, and they did it with creating these safeguards. That worked for almost 2,000 years, and then it failed to work in the modern period. Modernity doesn't work by three vows and Rabbi Elazar Modai. And so there has been a, an attempt now to kind of revive Jewish militancy in the modern period. And that's the last set of texts. Basically, what the, what the rabbis were doing, in, I'm talking in the last generation or two, what the rabbis are doing is basically is convincing the Jewish people that the state of Israel is in some way a messianic statement. The Six-Day War, or the 1948 War, the War of Independence, was <coughs> successful because God wanted it to be successful. It was, in essence, a milchemet mitzvah, a commanded war. But it wasn't understood that way. Nobody understood it that way. But it was what God willed. The uh, success in 1956 the amazing, miraculous success in 1967 in which the Israelis captured all of the holy sites of the Bible that were no, no longer outside the state of Israel was understood as a sign of the Messianic coming. But despite the fact that Israel conquered all of these territories, in that period of time after 1967, the government did not allow settlement to occur in these areas, except in some very minor locations. And there were people who were already beginning to feel this messianic impulse in them, and they were saying, we need to, con we need to settle these areas, as Nachmanides said, settling the land of Israel is our milchemet mitzvah. 
and we need to settle there, but they weren't allowed to. And then in 1973, there was a horrible war. We call it the Yom Kippur War, in which thousands and thousands of Israelis were killed by the attack of Egypt and Syria. After this tremendous success, like only six years earlier, some people saw that as a sign that God is ready to punish the Jews if they don't engage in settlement, in control of all of the land of Israel, because the Messiah is on his way. So there has been movement in Israel today, especially on, not by all Orthodox Jews, but by Orthodox Jews who are influenced by Zionism and, and modern nationalism that are, that, are, that are sort of combining nationalist ideologies with religious ideologies and seeing a transcendent meaning in the state of Israel and in the land of Israel and in the borders of Israel and they believe, and here, this is important for us to understand, they believe that if Jews don't settle all these areas, don't conquer, don't push the Palestinians out and take control of the land, like in the land of Israel, where there were no more Canaanites, not supposed to be any more Canaanites left, only Israelites, if they don't do that, God will punish the Jewish people. There are some people who are even afraid that there might be another Holocaust if when the Messiah is just ready to come, we're not ready to help in really realizing that messianic age. So the stakes are really high, and people really believe this stuff. I don't. I'm a researcher. I'm cold, cool, and collected in theory. Not really. And, but, um, but this is, becomes a big issue. Uh, and, and I also want to point out, this is not all Israelis. It's not even the majority of Israelis. But it's a very powerful minority that has a lot of uh, uh, gravitas, a lot of influence in the affairs of what's going on in Israel and the diaspora today. And so with that, I'm going to end my talk. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask them now or later. Thank you.